Uh, praise the Lord. Uh, this is actually our fifth message on this revival series. Preparing ourselves for the visitation of the Lord. Where we have been trying to look at our lives and see the things that need to be uprooted. Because there is what man must do and there is what only God can do. God visits when man is ready. When we look at the, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, John the Baptist actually came before him and John the Baptist was called the forerunner, the messenger who came to prepare the way before the coming of the Lord. And it is said in Matthew chapter 3, uh, verse 3, it actually says the, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight path for him. So before the Lord visits a group of people, there is the preparation. And the preparation has to talk about the lives of the believer being made straight, putting straight that which has become crooked, things that ought not to be in the believer's lives, being uprooted in order that the Lord may visit his people. So that is actually what we are doing. The essence of what we are doing is that we are preparing ourselves for a great revival that God wants to give to us. God wants to visit us, but before he visits us, we need to prepare our lives. We've already handled a number of things. The four first things that we needed to do, uprooting sin from our life, uprooting the self-life from our life, uprooting falsehood from our life, uprooting the world, the love of the world, and the love of the things of the world. And today, we shall be looking at freedom from all sexual immorality. Freedom from all sexual immorality. In the number of places in the Bible, when the Bible talks about the list of sin, sexual immorality is normally the first. You will read about it. Sexual immorality always coming most of the time first, and the Bible will talks about the sexual sin and talks about the consequences of those sexual sin. Let us look at some of those places in the Bible and actually see the, the critical importance of ensuring that we uproot all that has to do with sexual sin in our life because the, 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 the consequences are very grievous, they are very deep. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, the Bible talks about, the Bible says, do, not, do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? He said, do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, etc., we inherit, he said, neither any of the, none of these people will inherit the kingdom of God. You will see here, he talks about, he starts with sexual immorality. So we are talking about a sin that makes a person not to inherit the kingdom of God. And again, we see that it is the first sin that is mentioned. Coming again to Galatians chapter 5, verse, from verse 19 to 21, he says, the act of the sinful nature are obvious. You will see it again starting here. The act of the sinful nature are obvious. Number one, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, and again, these are all classification of sexual sin. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions and envy, envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Again, sexual sin being with the first sin and he's actually said if a person is involved in it, he cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So if you know what will make you not to inherit the kingdom of God, it becomes very important for you to confront how can you be set free from it. We see again in Ephesians, the book of Ephesians chapter 5 from verse 3, Ephesians 5, 3 says, but among you, 
there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, quasi joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of these you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, just a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. It's actually telling us that there should not be a hint not even a hint. He says such a person, such people have no inheritance. They have no place in the kingdom of God. Again, we see it is the starting, it is the first sin on the list of sin that says, if anybody is like that, you have no inheritance in the kingdom of God. The next place where it is mentioned again, and there are many places where in the Bible where sexual immorality is mentioned, we are just saying that most of the time, when you, uh, the, the Bible is talking about the list of sin, the sexual sin come first. So it is not something that is to be handled lightly. Chapter 3 of Colossians, chapter 3, from verse 5. It says, put to death therefore what belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust. These are things that belong to your earthly nature. And the Bible continues to tell us later on that those who live like that, because of that, the wrath of God is coming on the people who practice such sin. So we are handling freedom from what will take a person to hell. We are handling freedom from what we bring the wrath of God upon a person's life. We are handling freedom from what the Bible says, a hint of it should not be among God's people. So in each of these verses, we see that sexual immorality is mentioned first, and the consequences that the wrath of God, separation from God, and hellfire are actually the consequences. Broken relationship with God, that's what separation from God is all about. It is therefore important to know what sexual sin is, the consequences, and the way of freedom. If something will take you away from God, if something will lead to a broken relationship between you and God, if something will block you from having an inheritance in the kingdom of God, if something will bring the wrath of God upon your life, it is just being wise to study to know what is it all about? How can I come out of such a sin? And a good portion of what we will be handling today is taken from the book Freedom from the Sin of Adultery and Fornication by Professor Zachary Afomun. Freedom from the Sin of Adultery and Fornication. Brother Zach has handled this, uh, this, this topic very deeply and we will advise you that you look for a copy, read it, study it, pray it through in your life and enter into sexual freedom and enter into purity in your relationship with God when it has to do with the sexual life. So, we'll just look at, we'll read a number of places because our sharing is actually extract from different parts of this book written by Brother Zach. So we are trying to look at what is sexual sin? What is sexual immorality? Here we look at, we are looking at in chapter 8, when is adultery or fornication committed? Because adultery and fornication, they are just part of the sexual sin. Sexual sin, adultery is part of it. And in adultery, you have had sexual relationship with somebody when you are married. Sexual relationship with a married person is adultery. When you are not yet married, any sexual, uh, sexual sin is called fornication. There are different category classification of sexual immorality. Masturbation is sexual immorality. Reading immoral book is sexual immorality. Oh, all those things, some of them we will look at here. 
So I commit adultery or I commit fornication when I go to bed with anyone apart from my wife. And if you are not yet married or if you are married and you have slept with anybody that is not your marital partner, you have committed a sexual sin. When a sexual sin committed, I caress anyone to cause her to attain sexual fulfillment. The touching of people's body with an intention to make them to attain sexual fulfillment is called sexual immorality. Or you permit somebody to do the same to you. You know it in your heart that as a person is touching you, your passion, the desire on your heart is that you may attain sexual fulfillment, you may be stirred up sexually, that is called sexual immorality. Masturbation. In masturbation, you actually are stimulating yourself. You are the one doing it to yourself. Touching yourself in one way or the other in order to attain sexual uh, fulfillment. And we want you to know that when you are dealing with masturbation, you are actually committing a sexual sin with a demon. There's a demon somewhere where you are committing sexual sin with. Just that it's a spirit, you are preparing yourself, you are being used by the devil, and that's what masturbation is all about. When is sexual immorality committed? I kiss a woman secretly, be it on the jaw, be it on the lip, or be it on the hand. What the kiss, sexual, uh, kissing somebody secretly is sexual immorality. The embracing of a woman secretly, or the embracing of a man secretly, the squeezing of a woman's heart se hand secretly, or I, I caress any part of a woman's body, or all if you are a woman, of a man's body, hand, face, back, and so on, with desire. Even if it is done in public, you know you are the only one who knows it, whether you are doing it with desire. What is desire? Desire means to attain sexual fulfillment. I write a love letter, or you use your telephone to write message, a love message, something that you don't want someone to know, someone close to you, your marital partner, to know about it. You are committing sexual immorality through letters, through messages, through the WhatsApp, or all the time, you, or you are, if somebody look at you, you stay so long, late communicating with people on WhatsApp and that those are people that you would not want anybody to know about it in an increasing way it is not just sexual immorality with the opposite sex more and more sexual immorality with people of the same sex and sometimes you may not even know just the fact that certain messages begin to stir you in your inside mean you are living in the sin of sexual immorality I call a woman pet name. By the time you begin to call a, a, a woman, those names, my, my darling, my sweetheart, my this, and you don't want anybody to know about it when you are not yet married to that person, you are committing the sin of sexual immorality. I cherish a letter, or you cherish a message written by someone of the opposite sex to you that you don't want anybody to know about it. You, you hide it, you cherish it, you read it again and again. And if somebody was to come and look at it, you hide it. You know what that message means to you in your heart. You are committing the sin of sexual immorality. Or you visit a woman, or you visit a man, something that you will not want either your married partner, you will not want your parent, you will not want your lady, you don't want others to know about it. You are actually going for the visit. If somebody were to ask you, you would tell a lie because you, are, you know that you are going somewhere else. You are committing the sin of sexual abuse. You are not slept with the person, but it is a relationship that you are coping with the opposite sex. It is a sexual relationship. The same thing if you receive a visit. Somebody asks you, where are you? You tell a lie. Or you know that where you, where you are. You are trying to cover up a relationship somewhere. You are living in sexual immorality. Somebody asks you, where are you going? You, 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 you start stammering and tell the person something else. You are telling a lie. You are living, you know you are going to the opposite side. You are going to visit somebody that you don't want people to know about it. You are committing the sin of sexual immorality. 
When is sexual immorality committed? I read an immoral story. You know the type of books that you are reading. And as you are reading, you are being scared of sexual. You are so interested in sexual books, erotic books, those romantic books that you know it that in your inside, what it is doing to your inside. It is not making you to become purer and purer. You are committing the sin of sexual immorality. Or you watch an immoral video on your, uh, on your phone, they, they, they are watching pornography, immoral video, videos that are always turning towards sex, that are always turning to stare on others. You are committing the sin of sexual immorality. When is sexual immorality committed? I guess at the picture of a naked woman or one who has some part of her body exposed. You look at, you guess, or you bypass a woman poorly dressed as the person is going, you look back, or you may not even look back because you are driving, you look through the driving mirror, you are committing the sin of sexual immorality. You know it, it is not a pure look. You know it that if somebody were to ask, what are you looking at? You will not say, I was just looking at that, the, 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 the naked part of that woman. You are hiding something. You are walking in, 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 in immorality. When is sexual immorality committed? I deliberately look at a woman or a man's private part in a moment of her being or of her being off guard or his being off guard. A person has dressed poorly or is sitting down poorly and uh, the person exposes uh, herself. Then you look again and again, again and again, again and again. You are looking at something and you know that that is not what you ought to be looking at. You are committing the sin of sexual immorality. Sexual immorality is, is committed when you think immoral thoughts. The Bible says, Jesus uh, said about it, that you have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I say it unto you, if you look at a woman and you start lusting after a woman, so with your looks you can commit immorality. The Bible said the eye is the light of the body, the lamp of the body. If your eyes is pure, there's the, the impurity through the eyes, impurity through what you say, immorality through your words, immorality through your touching, immorality through your visits, immorality through your giving. You can speak an immoral or a suggestive word. Sexual immorality committed when you sing an immoral song and in an increasing way, look at the, the, the time, just listen to the songs around. Look at the, 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 the very odd video. The, most of the time, uh, as the worldly people, they compose their song, there must be a portion of it that is immoral. And then you are then listening to it, listening to it. And then after a time, you start having immoral dreams, immoral thoughts, immoral desires. Sexual immorality is committed when you listen to an immoral song, when you sing an immoral song. Sexual immorality is also committed when in an increase you find out that the, 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 you go out of your way to seek the company of women or men rather than that of the, your, your sex in carrying out what you call spiritual projects where the motive is not the great that they, that those people are just that are, are more available but just because you love to be in their company you are a male you are love you always love to be in the company of a female you something is wrong in your heart or you always prefer to preach to people of the opposite sex or to lead them to the Lord, build them up in Christ rather than some people of your own sex. These are acts of fornication. These are acts of immorality. These are acts of adultery. These are acts that don't make your heart to remain pure. These are not things to make you to begin to examine people's life, other people's life. Because you don't know a person may be doing something, there is nothing immoral about it. But you do it, there is something immoral with you. It is for each person to examine his own life. Because there are only two people who know you. You know yourself and God knows you. The sexual immorality in thought, a man is likely to do because for, before action, action first of all originate from your thinking. That's why the Bible says, as a man thinketh, so he is. So 
a man is likely to do the thing that he thinks about. So you can commit sexual immorality in your thought. A man is most likely to do the thing that he meditates on. A man will certainly do most of the thing that he has resolved to do. You think about, you meditate, then you decide to do. It starts with the thought. So be careful what you are thinking about. What a man thinks about, what a man reads, what a man uh, begins to talk about, very soon if he is not careful, he will begin to do it. Most sin have their origin in the mind. A man sees a girl, then the picture is placed on his mind, and if he is pure, he will pray, he will just pray and thank God for that girl. The beauty of a girl is not sin. God did not commit sin by creating a girl beautiful or creating a man handsome. You can look at a handsome person. And if your heart is pure, you will glorify, you worship God for the handsomeness or the beauty of that woman. The handsomeness of the man or the beauty of that woman, but when your heart is impure, you start meditating, then in your heart, you start undressing the woman, then in your heart, you are already on the bed with the woman, and very soon, the same dream begins to come to you at night. You are living in immorality. So you can have immorality in your looks. The same thing in your reading. If you, if you want to know a man, ask yourself, what does the man read? People read what they want to, want to read. So a man's reading material indicates very clearly what he wants to possess. A man will increasingly believe or do the thing that he reads about. The pure will read what is pure. If you want to be pure, read what is pure, and then it will get stored in your heart. That's what the psalmist says, you are what I have hidden in my heart, so that I will not sin against you. Instead of storing immoral stories, immoral things in your heart, or listen to immoral things, store the right thing in your heart. Your heart, if it has the right thing stored in it, will actually make you to become pure. Purity in your reading will lead to a pure life. Immorality in your dreams. And as we said, uh, most dreams reflect what, um, what is suppressed in the dreamer. Many people dream about the things they would like to actually do, but which for some reason or the other, they cannot. Most of the time, you are dreaming what is in your heart. You have suppressed it. You have suppressed it. So by your dream, if you are having immoral dream, just acknowledge before God that you are immoral. And sometimes the immoral dream is because you have opened yourself and immoral dream will possess, will possess you. And at night, they will begin to use you and begin to sleep with you. Those who practice adultery and fornication in their thoughts, in their reading, in their writing, and so on, who are not able to fully appropriate their sin in action. In other words, you are thinking about immorality, you are reading immoral things, you are writing immoral letters, and because you did not succeed to accomplish what you are reading about, first of all, it's stored in your heart. And as you begin to sleep, in your subconscious, you come forth. And the Bible says, dreams come in the multitude of business. And your business here is what you are reading, what you are thinking, what you are watching. Most of the people I have helped who have a problem with masturbation, and particularly the youth, because it is a stronghold that has taken them captive, when you go to the root of it, it came through their reading. It came through the, 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 the pornographic video they were watching. And as a result of that, something goes into their, their being, and after a time, they are being controlled by a demonic spirit and they begin to practice the act of masturbation. Adultery and fornication in acts. We have said that people are most likely to do what they meditate on. Sin is first of all committed in the mind before it is carried out in act. Sometimes it is committed many times in thought before it is committed. So a person begins to think about it, think about it, think about it, and finally you will practice what you have been thinking about. 
the consequence of adultery and fornication committed in thought and act are far reaching. You are never the same after you have given yourself. If you have been committing immorality in your thought, don't go to the next step. Labor to ensure that you get your freedom. Don't say, after all, I have already been lusting. Let me just commit an act. You will ruin your life because adultery, fornication, sexual immorality, they will ruin you in a way that you have never imagined. So we have said it is possible to commit immorality just by your thinking, by your reading, by your words, by the places you go through. And this whole thing is God knows the heart of everybody. What is God's attitude towards uh, immorality, towards sexual sin? In the Old Testament, God demanded very severe punishment for anybody who was involved in a sexual sin. We'll just look at it in two places here in the Bible. So God demands that those who are involved in sexual sin was severe punishment. In Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10, it says, if a man commit adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and adulteress must be put to death. So the consequence of the sexual sin there was that the person was killed. So just imagine that in our days, anybody who committed adultery and fornication was killed. Look at how people are frightened by the, 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 the virus that is around now. How many people have? And but within this period, how many people are committing immorality, committing adultery, committing fornication? But in the Bible, the Bible says, if you did that, you were killed. So God does not take it lightly. And in Leviticus chapter 21, verse 9, it says, if a priest's daughter defy herself by becoming a prostitute, she disgraces her father and she must be burnt in the fire. So a sexual sin committed by a leader's child. A leader's child. Look at how many uh, uh, children of spiritual leaders committing all sorts of immorality anyway. In those days in the Old Testament, they took you and burnt you to ashes. He said you have defied, you have disgraced the name of your Lord, disgraced the name of your parents. So sexual sin in the Bible carry great Terrible sentences. There are many other places. You were stoned to death. In some who died childless. In, if you went to marriage and not as a virgin, and it was discovered that you went a, a girl actually went to marry when you was not a virgin, it will that girl will be stoned to death. I wonder what will happen if that was done in our days. How many men go to marry as virgin? How many women go to marry? Virgin. So, sexual sin in the Bible was handled by God very seriously. It was not something like it. It was not something to be handled with jokes. In our, in our days, people just take it lightly. People talk about it lightly. All over the place. Immorality being practiced. All over, all over, all over. So, that in an increasing way, you are actually asking, who is sexually pure? People have deceived themselves that God, does, it does not matter before God. It does matter before God. So whether it was in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, we have already seen it, that if anybody was involved, is involved, we saw it in Galatians, we saw it in 1 Corinthians, we saw it in Colossians, we saw it in Ephesians, we will see it again in Revelation, it says, the wrath of God comes. A hint of it was not even supposed to be mentioned among God's people. And the Bible talks about it, that such a person will not inherit the kingdom of God. Sexual sin is a product of a wrong heart. It is from the inside. Out of the abundance of the man's heart 
out of the abundance of what is well in the mass heart. Some people flow out in purity. Some people flow out. They are in, they are present, bring immorality. I'll read a portion of here. You have sexual impact. What is inside a person will flow forth. When you meet someone, the extent to which in what sanctification has been produced in him will flow out in his dressing, in his speech, in his gesture, and in his look, uh, and so on. His inward man will flow out. So the, the condition of your heart, whether you are pure in your inside, whether you are pure in your inside, will flow out. A pure girl we create an atmosphere of purity. A pure man, young man, we create an atmosphere of purity. But there are some people, immediately they come, whoever was there, if you do not know inner sanctification and purity, their present release, uh, just releasing immoral thoughts, immoral desires. And they may think that it's because they are beautiful. It is not because you are beautiful. It is because you are rotten in the inside. Wherever you see flies, you know something is rotten somewhere. So if you are in an office, if you are in school, at the university, or in your class, and all the boys are lusting after you, they are not lusting after your beauty, they are lusting after your rotten, inner rottenness. A pure girl, people will be watchful, people are careful. It is as if there is an atmosphere, or a pure boy that says, keep your distance. So we have looked at what sexual immorality is and the goal of this sharing is actually for us to come to that point where we tend to say we want total freedom. Why don't you ask yourself, when you dress, have you ever asked yourself in my dressing, whom have I made to stumble? When I dress, do I expect, are my dressing suggestive? When I'm dressing, am I just telling people, here I am? Here I am. That which is valuable, that which is precious, is normally hidden. When a man values his sexuality, there are things about your body that you cover. You don't just expose to anybody. When a man values his relationship with God, there is that thing that only you, God, and maybe one day, that, that part, that person to whom you will marry, you see, but when you expose to everybody, it tells you that you don't even value your relationship with God. Let's look at freedom from sexual sin. We are sharing this to bring us to this point where we all desire and we all decide that we will enter into total freedom in the area of sexual sin. The first thing that anyone, so we have talked about freedom, anyone who wants to be delivered from the sin of adultery and fornication or from sexual sin, the first thing that such a person should know is that deliverance is actually possible. It starts with knowing that deliverance is possible. Only those who believe that it is possible can enter into experience of it. Those who through such People who threw their failure in the past believe that it is not possible. Because if you are saying, no, it is not possible to live in this sinful world if you are not immoral, then you are actually putting yourself under bondage. Deliverance is possible. You can live a life of sexual purity. You can to come to that point. You believe that you can be delivered. That is the first thing if you actually want to know deliverance from sexual purity, from sexual immorality. It is believing that it is possible. There are three things that will contribute to your deliverance from adultery, fornication, or from sexual immorality. The first thing is that you need to acknowledge that it is there. If you are living in sexual immorality, full of immoral thoughts, immoral passion, immoral looks, immoral desires, Im immoral relationship, etc., here and there, but you are telling yourself that it is not there, or telling others that it is not there, first of all, whatever you hide in your life will 
keep you in bondage. You will be bound by the thing that you actually are trying to cover. When you cover the enemy, you strengthen the enemy within. So the first thing is to accept that it is there. Why do you want to be delivered from what is not there? Then the second thing is that you need to have faith in the Lord Jesus. You need to have faith that the Lord Jesus Christ himself came to set you free. Jesus Christ, the deliverer, he said, for this reason was the Lord, the, the Son of Man manifest, that he might destroy the works of the enemy. Sexual immorality is part of the works of the enemy. So a person can be delivered if you come to that point, acknowledge that you have a problem. After all, it is the sick people who look for a physician. If you know that you are sick through the sin of immorality and you acknowledge it and you turn to the Lord, you are on the pathway of being delivered. But when you say, I have no problem in this area, you are on the pathway of bondage. Then the last thing is that you need to cooperate with the Lord. Talking about the fact that a person can ought to put his faith in the Lord. You have faith in the Lord Jesus. In Romans chapter 8, verse 3 to 4, we are going to read it. Romans chapter 8. He said, for what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering, so that he, so that he condemned sin in sinful man. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful nature to be a sin offering, so that he condemned sin in a sinful man. God sent the Lord Jesus to condemn, to overthrow, to break the power of immorality over every man's life who come to be identified with the Lord. So the Bible says, for God has done what the Lord was weakened by the flesh to do. What the Lord weakened by the flesh could not do. God sending his own son, he sent Jesus Christ. So God has done for you what you could not do, what your decision, what your resolution could not do. In Christ, he, Christ went to, when Christ went to the cross and died, he condemned sin in the flesh. That's what faith, by believing that when Jesus Christ went to the cross, the power of sin was broken. The same thing when we look at freedom from falsehood, freedom from sin, we're looking at it last time in Romans chapter 6, the fact that our sinful nature was crucified. So freedom from sin, from sexual immorality, is not just each of our decision. It is first of all knowing that when Jesus Christ went to the cross, something happened. He took the power of immorality and as he was dying, the immoral flesh, the sinful nature was crucified. So when the Lord went to the cross, he took the power that adultery and fornication had over you with him and crucified that power, nailing it to the cross. That is what you need to believe. He did it. He did it. It is not he will do it. It is that when he went to the cross, history says it. The truth, the word of God says it. He went to the cross and had he died, the sinful nature in anyone who was ever to surrender his life to him was crucified. From the day on which the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross, the power of adultery and fornication of our believers in the Lord Jesus Christ was broken. The day that your freedom came, not just when you believe, your freedom came on the day that the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross. And when you come to Jesus, you are actually coming to freedom. Every believer can therefore put adultery and fornication over under control. Because of what Jesus did, every believer in the Lord received the power to live a life free from the sin of adultery and fornication. Every believer. The third thing that the, 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 the believer ought to do is that he should cooperate with God. When we are looking at freedom from sin the first time, we saw that we should put to death the believer should cooperate with the Lord to put to death all that is of his sinful nature. 
then he should have his mind renewed, begin to think like God, begin to read the word, begin to make it, begin to see sin the way God sees it. Sin is not a mistake, it's not an error, it's not what he should say, after all, everybody is doing it. Yes, if everybody is doing it, then everybody will go to hell. Come to that point where you see sin as God sees it, and you tell yourself, no. I will think the way God thinks, and I'm going to begin to meditate on the things that are pure, the things that are honorable, the things that are true. I will no longer feed my eyes on immoral things. I will no longer feed my ears on immoral songs. There are things that you should do. You should cooperate with God. Freedom comes by, first of all, acknowledging that you are in bondage, by believing that Jesus Christ paid the price, and you cooperating with Him. There are things that you need to pluck out. That's what the Bible says. If you are right hand person, you do sin, you cut it off. There are relationships to be broken with. There are relationships that you need to break. There are places that you should say, I will never go to this place because if I go, I will be tempted. There are people that you should say, I will. This person has constantly been taking me towards the wrong direction. Even if the relationship is as useful to you as what, it is useful not in court that will take you to hell. The Bible says, if it causes whatever causes you to sin, cut it off. Why don't you tell yourself, there are certain things on your on, on site you will never open your mobile phone. There are certain things of program you will never watch. If you are constantly, if you go somewhere, each time you go down watching pornography, you tell yourself, I will never go there. Why don't you tell yourself, I will not go to this party because when I go, I will see the wrong thing. Job said, I have in Job chapter 30, verse 1, he said, I have in 31, verse 1, I have entered into a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at any young girl. Enter into a covenant, tell yourself, enter into that covenant with God. So freedom is possible. Cooperate with God and do like Joseph. We look at the example of Joseph, who was being tempted by Potiphar's wife. Even when he wanted, the, the woman wanted to catch Joseph and force her and sleep with Joseph. The Bible says Joseph fled. Sexual sin is not resisted. The Bible says flee all form of sexual immorality. There are moments that you run, need to run away. Run away from a place, run away from a person, run away. There are jobs that you should resign from. Because in that job, the boss there is constantly trying to tempt you, to tempt you. There are some places that you may need to pack your thing and change houses. Because where you are, you are in the wrong place. The atmosphere is polluted. Live a life that is sexually pure. There's a lot of blessing by living such a life here on earth. And that reward here on earth, your mind will, will there will be no guilt condemning you. You are, you are you'll be able to concentrate with nothing condemning you. You will live a life not afraid. Maybe I have it. Maybe I've got this disease, etc. Then in the life to come, the Bible says, "Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God." Acknowledging that you have a problem with immorality. And turning to the Lord and believing that the Lord paid the price to set you free, then you ask yourself, What must I do to cooperate with God? What are the things I must root in my root of root in my life? What are the, the dresses I must destroy? Some of the dresses when you put on your suggestive dresses and people begin to run after you, or places you go, there are places you must no longer go, there are relationships that you must break, there are certain things you need to do cooperating with God in order that you may begin to walk in sexual purity. After you have done all that, you need to ask to be filled daily with the Holy Spirit. Even if you have uprooted everything, your heart will remain empty. Ask to be filled daily. Be filled daily with the Holy Spirit, hour by hour with the Holy Spirit. That's why the Bible says, walk in the Spirit and you will not gratify the desire of the sinful nature. Give yourself to useful things. Let the Spirit of God fill you so that you flow out in the Spirit. Let the, the thing that you do no longer be the thing that will bring temptation to you. Keep a distance 
from where you will be tempted. If you know where somewhere you will be tempted, it is better not to go than where you are being tempted and you are resisting temptation. You are wasting your energy for no reason. Get up, up root the things in your life, get filled with the Holy Spirit, and give yourself to meditate constantly on the Word of God. Hide the Word of God in your heart and take a stand to say, I will walk right with God. And you'll be surprised that in an increasing way, you will not only be walking in purity, you will create an atmosphere of purity around you. And nobody one day will say, you let him to hell. You make him to stumble by your way of life. We can all walk in purity. It is possible the Lord has made it possible. And as you do it, the Lord will dwell more and more, more and more for your body is the temple of the living God. You cannot take the temple of the living God and share it with a prostitute somewhere, with a demon somewhere through masturbation.